Hi, welcome to recitation 12. So today we're going to be talking about MP completeness. So let's review some definitions again. If a problem is MP complete, it just means that it's both in NP and NP hard. And we already know what NP means. It means that the problem is verifiable in polynomial time or solvable in non-deterministic polynomial time. Now, what does it mean to be NP hard? It just means that every problem in NP can be poly time reduced to your problem. Um, and remember that a mapping reduction tells you that you're at least as hard as the problem or language that you reduced from. But providing a poly time reduction from all problems in NP is like not something you can do, right? Because there's like infinite problems. So instead, what we do is to prove that something is NP hard, we just need to provide a poly time reduction from any NP complete problem. And the reason why this is okay is because you both have this like upper bound of um, how hard it can be. Like if you know that it's not harder than the hardest problems in NP because it's in NP. And if you know that it's NP hard, then you know that all problems in NP can be poly time reduced to that original NP complete problem. And if you can provide a poly time reduction from that problem to your new problem, then overall you can do a poly time reduction from any problem in NP to the new problem by combining these reductions. So here we have a visual to show the relationship between all of these classes of problems. So as you can see, we have NP, um, which has P inside of it. And we don't know where this boundary is. Like, we don't know um, if P equals NP. So we have a dotted line for it. And NP hard encompasses the hardest problems in NP, which is um, NP complete, like the overlap between NP hard and NP. And you also have problems that are harder, like X time and all the problems that are even harder than that. So if P equals NP, then the diagram would look like this, right? Like we know that P encompasses this whole circle and all NP complete problems are in NP. So they're also this circle and all of them would be in NP hard as well. But in reality, we don't know where like this boundary lies. We don't know if this extends all the way down and we don't know if this extends all the way up. So the reason why we care about proving that problems are NP complete is because suppose someone at some point finds a polytime algorithm to solve a problem, right? To decide the language. And because it's NP complete, we know that it's NP hard, which means that all problems in NP can be polytime reduced to L, right? So using this, we can construct a polytime decider for all problems in NP. So first you run the reduction from A to L, and then run this polytime decider that we just discovered, and return the result. Right, like do what it does. Like if this decider accepts an L, then we accept, and if it rejects, then we reject. And this works because we had reduced A to L so that for all inputs in A, we outputted something in L, and for all inputs not in A, we outputted something not in L. We know that overall this is polynomial time because step one is obviously poly time, and now step two is also poly time. And now for all problems in NP, we have constructed this poly time decider which means that all problems in NP can be decided in polynomial time, which means that P equals NP, right? All problems in NP are necessarily also in P. So again, the reason why we care about proving that problems are NP complete is because if someone proves any of the NP complete problems are actually in P, then you can collapse the whole class of NP into P. Now, what do these proofs actually look like? Um, what you have to do is satisfy both parts of the requirements to be NP-complete. The first requirement being that it's in NP, which you already know how to do by providing a polytime verifier for the language. And the second part is prove that it's NP-hard. So what you're going to do is pick a problem that's already NP-complete, provide a polytime reduction to your new problem, and along with the time complexity analysis, you also have to prove correctness using these int-in -in and out-to-out -out cases. Alternatively, for the out-to-out -out case, you could do the reverse int-in -in case, which, if you'll notice, is just the contrapositive of the out-to-out -out case. This might be, like, the trickiest part of the proof. So this is 
problem one for my question 12, and we're going to show that the language that set is empty complete, where uh, the input is C, and C has um, at least two different satisfying assignments. And we want to show that that set is an MP. So the first step is to come up with a polytime verifier certificate. And our certificate here is going to be the two distinct satisfying assignments, A1 and A2 for C. And the verifier is just going to check that A1 and A2 are different. So that means that they assign one literal differently. And it's going to check that they both satisfy C. So that means that um, it's going to be able to satisfy an assignment for B, both of them. And we can do both of these steps in time calls and both sides. So it's a call to time verifier. So now we're going to reduce that to that set on the real time. And so it might seem obvious that if that is an NP, then so is that set because if something has two satisfying assignments, then that means that it has one. But we need to come up with a reduction. So we need to um, map the input for any Boolean formula into the set that can be um, also input into that set, where if C is in set, then our modified input is in that set. And if our modified input is in that set, then C is in set. So, the first step is we're going to generate a new formula where, and we're going to call it C2, where it's just C, but we're going to add a conjunction and um, a literal X or not X. So this is going to ensure that we can have two satisfying assignments because if X is a variable we haven't used before in C, then the assignment is going to be satisfied whether or not X is true. So yeah, so that's going to allow us to satisfy those directions. And so we can run the algorithm for set set on C2 and just return with it return. And so this construction of C2 takes polynomial time because it just rewrites C and adds one more clause. So here's a proof um, to show that if C isn't set, then C2 isn't set set um, bidirectionally. So if C is in set, then that means that there's a satisfying assignment A of C. And that means that for every variable in A, there is an assignment to true or false that satisfies C. Um, so, so that means that A1 is going to be A or X, where X is assigned to true, and A2 is going to be A or X being assigned to false. And so we know that these two distinct assignments will satisfy C2 because X is an occurrence C, and we know that X can be either of the two. And we can't reuse a variable that was already in A because then if A requires some assignment of that variable, then it might not be able to be, it might not yield A1 and A2 because X might be false and needs to be false in A, and it wouldn't be able to take on these two assignments that both are guaranteed to satisfy C2. So that would mean that C2 is in that set. And to go the other way, um, if C2 is in that set, then that means that there's two satisfying assignments that are distinct. Um, and if we remove that, that X variable from C2, we know that it would satisfy C because we did a conjunction. So if that was removed, then the clause A already had to be satisfied before we added the conjunction. And the variable X didn't appear in C, so we know that that doesn't affect anything. And so that means that C isn't that. So for the second problem, it's basically taking a class of languages C where we say a language A is cozy if the complement of that language A is in class C. So the first, so part A is asking if language A is regular if and only if A is co-regular. And we know that this is true because regular languages are closer to complement. 
For B, it's asking if context-free is equal to co-context-free. And we know that this is not the case because if you remember from the solo homework, we did a pre-teasing to Morgan's law where we know that if context, because context-free languages are closed under union, we know that if they were closed under complement, then we would have their closed under intersection, which is not possible because we know that um, the class of context-free languages is not closed under intersection. And part B is asking if co-decidable is equal to decidable. And we know that these are equal because the set of decidable languages are closed under complement. And this makes sense because we know if the language is decidable that the machine will halt and accept or reject. And so we know that if it hasn't accepted a string, that means it is going to reject it and vice versa. So that's closed under complement. Part C asks us if CoP is equal to P. And we know that P is closed under complement because for any language L that's in P, that means there's a TM, M, for example, that decides it in polynomial time. So we can construct a Turing machine M prime that decides the complement of L in polynomial time by doing that just runs M on the sum input W and then does the opposite of what it does. For part E, we have to prove that we don't know whether the complement of MP is not equal to NP because this would imply that P does not equal NP. So we're going to work with the contrapositive because it's a bit easier to think about. And that, began, that starts by um, taking the second half of our implication and negating it. So, so we begin with the statement that P equals NP. And that means for every language A in P, that means that A is also an NP and vice versa. Then the second statement states that if for every language A in NP, that means it's also in P. And if A complement is in NP, that means that A complement is also in P. And this is because P is closed under complement. So we know that if A complement is in P, and that means that A is in P. And we know that A complement is in NP because of our statement that P equals NP. So then if A is in NP, that means that A complement is in P. And this is because from the first part of the previous statement, we know that if A is in NP, then A is in P. And if A is in P, then A complement is also in P. So for the next statement, we know that because P is a subset of NP, for every language A in NP, that means the complement is in NP. And if A complement is in NP, that means that A is in NP. And so the next statement, we are able to say that if A is in NP, that means that A is in the complement of NP. And if A is in the complement of NP, then A is in NP by definition of co-NP. And then for all A, if A is in NP, that means that A is in the complement of NP. So if we were able to say that NP is close under complement, then we would be able to show that P equals NP, which we know that we don't know the answer to. So that's the proof for Part E. Now let's move on to problem three. So the problem here is you have an army invading from the north, and uh, your leader wants you to track their movements using watchtowers on these mountains. Um, so you can have a watchtower on every mountain, but you don't have enough men to watch every tower. However, some mountains are visible from other mountains. So we're going to represent this with like edges in a graph. So let each uh, mountain be a vertex and let the edges represent that. You can uh, see one tower from the other. Um, let's say that there's like a cloud here, so you can't see from here to here, but you can see like here to here and uh, here to here. And let's say those two are too far, so you can't see those. And how about here to here, because they're close. Now your job is to tell the king, given some number of watch parties, could you man enough watchtowers so that every mountain is covered? So for example, if I only have two watch parties, I could man this tower and this tower, and then that makes it so that all five mountains are covered. 
So you have recognized that this problem is actually NP complete, and you don't want to tell your king without uh, proper evidence, because he'll just be mad that you're claiming, oh, it's too hard to figure out if a number of watchtowers is right. So now your job is to uh, prove that it is NP complete so that he's not mad at you when you tell him. The key here is to recognize that the problem you're dealing with is dominating set. Recall from the previous homework assignment that a graph has a dominating set of size k if every vertex in the graph is either in the dominating set or is adjacent to a vertex in the dominating set. So you should have already proved this in the previous homework assignment, so I won't go too into it, but Night's Watch, which is actually dominating set, is in NP because you can construct a verifier that takes in a subset of V as a certificate and check that the certificate is of size less than or equal to k, and that each vertex is in the set or is adjacent to a vertex in the set. This should run in polynomial time, thus it is verifiable in polynomial time. Now that you've had some practice proving that problems are in NP, you don't really have to do the whole very detailed verifier anymore, if it's clear that the verifier works. So now to prove NP hard, we're going to do a reduction from 3 set. Reminder that 3SAT is just a set of satisfiable Boolean expressions that are made up of clauses and it together, and each clause is made up of three literals or together. So our mapping reduction takes in a Boolean expression, and let's, for example, use the expression x or y or not x, and not y or z or z. Now for every variable in the expression, which in this case are x, y, and z, we're just going to make three nodes for each. So we're going to make a node for true, a node for false, and a third placeholder node. Same thing for y and z. We connect all of these in a triangle. Now, for every clause in the expression, we're going to add a node as well. So clause 1 and clause 2. Now we're going to add edges for every variable that appears in the clause. So if true x appears in clause 1, we're going to make an edge to clause 1. True y appears in clause 1 as well. And false x appears in clause 1. Now false y appears in clause 2. And true z appears in clause 2 twice. So we can just use one edge for that. Now what we output at the end of the reduction is the graph that we just created plus n, where n is the number of variables in the original Boolean expression. So there's three different variables, x, y, and z, so we're going to output g and 3. So notice that the original expression we're given doesn't give us the assignments, and the final graph that we're creating doesn't have the dominating set as part of the graph. There must exist a dominating set for this graph of size 3 if the original expression was satisfiable, but in the reduction, we're never going to solve either problem in order to reduce from one to the other. Notice, however, that the satisfying assignments should correspond with the actual dominating set. So in this case, a satisfying assignment would be x could equal true or false, it doesn't really matter. Let's say it's true, and y could be true or false as well, it also doesn't matter. And if y is true, then z must be true. So if you color in x true, uh, y true, and z true, then we have successfully created a dominating set because there is an edge from every clause to, a, to the assignment, and there's also an assignment for every variable, which is what this triangle was for. On the other hand, if you have an unsatisfiable Boolean expression such as x or x or x, and not x or not x or not x, then the graph that you output will not be able to have a dominating set of size 1. So the graph that we'll create will have um, the three vertices for x connected in a triangle, and there are two clauses, c1 and c2. And C1 will only have an edge to true x, and C2 will only have an edge to false x. Notice that the minimum dominating set of this graph is 2, because both of these need to be true, but we're outputting 1 because there's only 
one variable x. So because the original expression was not in 3-set, the final graph and k is not in uh, Night's Watch. This is what the proof looks like formally, and this last line that says we run our black box for Night's Watch on uh, the graph and n that we output and return what it returns. This is just saying what I mentioned at the beginning of the video, which is that if we had a polytime algorithm to solve Night's Watch, then we can use it to solve 3 sat in polytime as well. So returning what it returns would be like the last line of the decider for 3 sat. And of course this algorithm runs in polynomial time because we're making a graph that has three vertices for every variable in the original expression and one vertex for every clause in the original expression. And the number of variables and the number of clauses are both order of the length of the whole expression. So overall it's still linear time. To finish your proof, you need to provide the proof of correctness. And before, you usually just did like if and only if statements for the two directions. But for MP complete proofs, you're going to need a little bit more work uh, and discuss to argue your case. So in the forward direction, you have a Boolean expression in three sats, which must have some satisfying assignments. A possible dominating set created from this assignment will be the vertices that correspond to the actual assignment of each variable. So if a variable x has to be set to true, then the x true vertex will be part of the dominating set, and if it's false, then x false vertex will be in the dominating set. So clearly there are n vertices, because each variable in the original expression corresponds to a vertex in the dominating set, and it can monitor all nodes in the variable gadgets, meaning that it can reach all three vertices in the triangle nodes. Now since each clause is satisfied by the assignment, then there's at least one node that has an edge with each clause that represents making that clause true. Thus all the vertices created from the assignment will be the dominating set that can reach all of the other vertices in the graph. In the reverse direction we have a gn that must be in Night's Watch, and because it was constructed from our algorithm, it must have n groups of triangles, or three vertices that are all connected, and some number of other vertices that originally represented clauses. And because gn is in Night's Watch, it must have a dominating set, and because the triangles are fully connected, one vertex from each triangle must be part of the dominating set. And since this dominating set must be able to reach all vertices in the graph, the clause nodes must each be connected by at least one edge to one of the vertices in the dominating set. So if we let the vertices in the dominating set represent the corresponding assignments and let the clause nodes represent the clauses, then the Boolean expression that would have formed this graph and n must be satisfiable by just taking the assignments that correspond to each dominating set vertex. So just keep in mind that what you're doing is you're taking something in your output language that must have been constructed from your own algorithm and show that whatever it came from originally, which is a uh, Boolean expression, must have been in the original language because of the constraints of the language and how you constructed it. Like the graph that you're given doesn't actually have all of the vertices and the triangles labeled as like x true, x false, or whatever, and it doesn't have like the clause vertices labeled either because, you know, it's just a graph. But if it was constructed from the algorithm, like in this case, this was constructed from the algorithm with n equals 4, then you know that None of the clause vertices can be in the dominating set because they won't be able to reach that placeholder vertex in the triangle, and you can't have two vertices in the dominating set from one triangle because then you'll be missing out on one of the triangles. So by like the pigeonhole principle or whatever, there will be one vertex in each triangle in the dominating set, and because this is in Night's Watch, then there is at least one edge from each triangle to each clause node, which means that whatever Boolean expression this came from, must have been satisfiable if you just pretend all of these edges from clauses to triangles are 
the literals and the vertices and the triangles would have been the variable assignments. Thus, we've showed that Night's Watch is both um, in NP and NP hard, which means it must be NP complete. That's all. Thanks for watching.